Since the time of slavery, blacks all over the world have made a different kind of history with our achievements in science, politics and the arts. One man who's done probably more than anyone else to gain recognition for that slice of history is the musician Stevie Wonder, with hits like Black Man and Jamming, his tribute to Bob Marley. Well, he's done it again, with his co-writer on some of these songs, Gary Bird. They've burst into the British pop chart with The Crown, a ten-minute rap on some of the best-known black names in history. We can't play it all, but here's just a flavour. By the way, the robotics are by a South London group called Modus Operandi. When you wear the crown, you will not need to smoke, to come to dust or speed. With the crown, you can become the high, and you will make it if you try. But don't you ever forget what it will take to wear the crown. You cannot fake. If you're going to leave, you got to be a king and give the world your everything. Or be a man like Malcolm X and a man for all the very best. Or conduct a railroad like Harry and we all owe her a lifetime debt. If you're going to fight, don't do it free. Make them pay to see just like Ali. Or sing like Ella and make them guess. Is it you or is it Memorex? If you play a sport, become number one. Like Joe Lewis and Jackie Robinson. Make Dr. J your shining star. Shoot like magic, dunk with your bar. Or if you can write, then write some books. Like Langston Hughes or R. Miss Brooks. If you think you're smart, don't deceive us. Be an Imhotep, be a genius. And don't let anybody confuse the fact you don't win. Just because you're black, everybody in the world has a crown in place that becomes their culture and their face. And so it is, we will not deny our history or by the line. We have no claim to be renowned when we were first to wear the crown. Welcome to Black on Black. Now, um, The Crown has been streaking up the charts. I think it came in at 21. It's now at number six. And you went round the clubs on Saturday. How's it been doing? What's the reception been well, like? Well, it's been doing very well. Um, I came uh, really to London from Germany, from Munich, actually, where we did a videotaping uh, for a television show there called Formula One. Mm -hmm. And we came in really kind of for the first evening for sort of a night on the town, a quiet night, I was told. And uh, when we went around to the clubs, the reaction was just so fantastic, uh, really, from all sorts of people in London, a very multi-ethnic type audience. And I wound up performing in about three clubs all yeah. over London, you know, I just, uh, I couldn't resist, <laughs> you know, so uh, we had quite a bit yeah. of fun and the response has been really very yeah. fantastic. Now I think people love dancing to it because it is dance music, but it's more yes. than that, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. What is the crown exactly? Well, the crown is really a point of consciousness at which all people can achieve their true potential. Uh, in many cases, I think that all of us uh, suffer from uh, the ideas that people have of those things that we can't do uh, for whatever reason. Sometimes it may be race, sometimes it's lack of education and so forth. And the crown is a place uh, in our minds uh, where we can go and where all becomes achievable. Yes. Now there are lots of references in the crown to black history and for instance um, at the beginning, the part that we didn't play, you make a reference to a crew, a black crew, who sailed to America long before Columbus. Who were they? Yes, well Dr. Ivan Van Sertiman, who is uh, from Guyana, has documented in a book called They Came Before Columbus the fact that 2,000 years before uh, Columbus arrived uh, to the New World that Africans had made the journey, not one time, but several times, and not by accident, but deliberately. The proof of their visit is uh, a series of stone heads, which are about eight feet high, and which weigh somewhere between 40 and 50 tons. Now, these stone heads have uh, on their faces features that are absolutely African in origin. Now, there's been some, uh, some level of, of a reaction to this by a number of uh, anthropologists, um, many who say it is indeed obviously true, and others who say that perhaps the reason that they look so much like Africans is because the tools weren't sharp enough to cut the lips <laughs> properly. <laughs> I see. Why do you think more people don't know about this? I, I certainly didn't know it. Well, one of the things that, that uh, has been pointed out by a number of the historians that I've had the opportunity of studying under, uh, Dr. Ben Yekinen, uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, and mm. Dr. Ben Sertiman, is the fact that in many cases what we read in the history books is exactly that. It is his story, not our, our story. story. Yes. And in many cases, uh, the his represents individuals who, for their own purposes, 
have chosen to sort of diminish the contributions of people of African descent and other minorities as well. Well, the Crown certainly tells our story, and to bring it more up to date, there are references to people we all know like Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. But um, for a British audience, some of the people you mention as wearing the crown or nearly wearing the crown, we don't know about. There's somebody called Dr. J yes. and Magic, who are apparently baseball and basketball players, basketball aren't they? Basketball players, yes. yes. Uh, well, Dr. J is, his name is not Dr. J originally, it's Julius Irving. Mm -hmm. But he became so proficient on the court that he literally became a doctor of basketball. <laughs> and so he was called Dr. J for a tremendous ability to to fly through the air and, seem, and make seemingly impossible shots and passes and just for the tremendous effort that he displays on the court. Uh, Magic Johnson uh, was able to literally handle a basketball like a magician on the court. So he became known as Magic Johnson. And what these, these individuals have in common to me as far as the crown is concerned is that they represent uh, achievement at its best the idea of becoming the best that you can become. Yeah, yeah. And at the point that you achieve that, I think it becomes very difficult for anyone, no matter what their racial uh, philosophies or whatever, to deny that the best is the best. I want to come back to the ideas later and to your connection with Stevie Wonder, who wrote the music for this. But I want to talk a little bit about you. Now, you started as a disc jockey when you were still at school at about 16. Yes. And you introduced rapping into your DJ work. Why did you do that? Well, uh, I was exposed in 1965 when I actually got connected with radio at about age 15 uh, to a tape which was a tape of a style that was being done at that point which started in the late 50s by American black DJs uh, who were rapping to the beat yeah. and uh, when I heard the style on the tape no one was doing it in my hometown which is Buffalo New York and I was sort of entranced by the idea so when I got a full-time show I at 17 after working a year part-time I decided I would do this. Now, the sort of thing that they were into in the first tape I heard was a guy by the name of Jocko Henderson. Uh -huh. And Jocko would do a thing back in the late 50s and early 60s that was based around what he called the rocket ship show. Uh -huh. So he would have a thing where he'd say, uh, once again, it's rocket ship time, and those not aboard must be out of their mind. The rocketeers are lined up side by side, are ready to take a most exciting ride. From the earth to the moon, you've uh, got to go with your rocket ship commander, a Jocko. Back on the scene with the record machine. Correct time now is 5.16. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, later on, you moved to New York, and yes. through your radio show there, when you did rapping as well, you came to know Stevie Wonder, who yes. I gather was a fan of your radio show. Yeah, ironically, it was kind of a mutual admiration society. I grew up, as, as many of us have, listening to Steve and admiring him. I bought a little slide harmonica when I was uh, 14, oh. trying to play fingertips, vainly, I might add. And uh, the result of my being on the air was uh, I was doing rapping on the air, and Steve would call me. He's a very avid radio listener, and he mm -hmm. would call and say, hey, I really like that rap that you did, yeah. you know, and that was pretty good. And it was sort of encouraged me, and it began the development of our relationship. Well, you wrote some lyrics for him to songs that he'd already written, but this time I believe that you had the idea for The Crown, and yes. you took it to Stevie, who then did the music for it. Yes, actually, I was lyricist for Village Ghetto Land and for mm. Black Man, and... Uh, so about two or three years later, I had an idea for something called The Crown, and uh, the purpose was to somewhat tell our story and to put together something that would be motivational to people of all races. Yes. And uh, I was on my way to the studio when Stevie called, and he said, hey, what you up to? And I said, well, I'm on my way to the studio, and I got the session, and it's really getting late. You know, I said, so I'm, you know, really running a little bit behind. He said, oh, what are you up to? I said, I'm recording a tune called The Crown. And he said, uh, well, what's The Crown? I said, it would take too long to explain, believe me. I said, but I'll record it, and I'll give you a call back. He says, no, 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 I want to hear it. So I said, okay, well, I played it through the telephone, and he said, in the middle of it, he started sort of shouting. I said, what's wrong? Is it too loud? He said, no, I want you to catch the next plane to Los Angeles because I'm the only one who can do that music for you. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, um, um, you were both very interested in this business of using music to explain to black people their history. Yes. Um, this is something that you both have in common. Yes. What are you going to be doing in future? Well, yeah, I'm very much committed to the idea of reaching um, people on a national and international level. Music certainly serves that, that, uh, that purpose. And my efforts are going to continue in recording and also into radio and to television hopefully internationally in terms of being able to reach out to people across the globe with yeah. communications. Now, if this were your show and you were signing off, how would you do it in New York when uh, you're finishing off your show? What sort of well, thing I'll do you do say? It, I'll do it as if I'm in London. Okay, right. Okay. Um, this is the London rap. Here we go, the <laughs> London rap. Okay, I might say, uh, 
London, if you dig, if you dig jazz, funk, or soul, then you know that I'm your guy. I keep the music mighty mellow and the conversation fly. Now I want you to know that qualification is an indication of what will make you a sensation across the nation and a natural asset to any situation. I'll join you tomorrow in the GBE. Until then, remember, life is the ultimate trip once you learn to experience it. Oh, Gary, thank you very much indeed.